Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, has called for expression of interest forms uh, from qualified oil and gas firms for the operation and maintenance of the newly refurbished Port Harcourt refinery. In a notice to its would-be clients, the National Oil Company stated that when the process is completed, the outcome would help improve dependability and sustainability to meet the country's fuel supply and energy security requirements. In 2021, Group Chief Executive Officer of NNPC, Mele Kiari, stated that the federal government was considering a plan to become a minority shareholder in the beleaguered oil refineries. That was after the Federal Executive Council, FEC, signed off on a $1.5 billion rehabilitation plan funded largely by Afriksim Bank, as well as from internally generated revenue by NNPC for the Port Harcourt refinery, Refining Complex, which has a capacity of 210,000 barrels per day. In a separate statement, NNPC said the operate and maintain model was one of the key requirements by the lender for the Port Harcourt project. In the public notice, among others, NNPC stated that any company applying to operate and maintain the plant must present its audited accounts between 2019 and 2022, as well as demonstrate a minimum average annual turnover of $2 billion between 2019 and 2022. However, former Vice President of Nigeria, Atiku Abubakar, has faulted the plan by the NNPCL for a third party to manage the Port Harcourt refinery after its rehabilitation. Atiku argued that the federal government ought to have privatized the refinery instead of commencing rehabilitation. Joining us on the show this morning to discuss this latest NNPCL initiative for the running of the Port Harcourt refinery is Israel, i.e partner at Commercial and Energy Law Practice, Kandelp. Good morning, uh, Ms. Aya, and thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. All right, I'll start... Good morning, thank you. Good morning. I'll start off with um, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar's position. Let's even have that conversation. The NNPC is opening up to invite an expression of interest form from private organizations to um, manage the Port Harcourt refinery on completion. However, the vice, former vice president is of the opinion that they shouldn't even be asking for, you know, other, you know, for partners to come and manage. They should instead sell the refinery outright to avoid the debts that will accrue from holding on to the refinery. What's your take on his position? Thank you very much. Uh, so several years ago, um, I remember that was probably uh, the onset of the Obasanjo regime. Uh, then I used to be employed uh, with one of the international oil companies. And I remember that uh, the government of the day made very desperate efforts to offload the refineries then uh, to a number of potential uh, investors or entities that have the capacity to be able to run this. And they, 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 uh, there wasn't that much appetite for it. Of course, at the tw uh, in the twilight years of that particular regime, uh, they then uh, sold to a consortium that comprised uh, of uh, Dangote, I think, Cotelola, and a few others, uh, which sale was rescinded uh, during the Aradua regime and all that. But the whole point of this history lesson is to say that the subject of uh, divesting, privatizing, or selling off uh, these uh, uh, entities or these uh, refineries is not as simple and straightforward as people think. There's probably not a lot of appetite for it. What some of the experts have said and have heard is that it's probably easier to build a brand new refinery <coughs> than to, excuse me, <coughs> uh, than to to take over these refineries and refurbish them. As a matter of fact, if you, if you have heard some of the commentators, I think uh, Engineer Ogedegbe, who used to be managing director of the Portacot refinery as well as the Kaduna refinery at some point, indeed expressed the view and opinion that what was going on was in fact a, a replacement of the equipment. They're literally stripping off the old, uh, and, and as a 60,000 uh, barrels a day uh, capacity uh, component of that refinery, and they're replacing them. So, Indeed, if you said sell, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 our experience show that there's probably not a lot of people who have the appetite to buy or for, 
for, for good value. So that's probably the way to look at it. Um, indeed, if you had a car, and a fairly used car, and you wanted to sell it, it's unlikely that you would, if you put it out in its state, then it probably would go uh, as crap. But if you refurbished it a bit, and then you sell it, then you probably can get better value for it. Uh, just without, I'm not necessarily part of this, I'm not holding brief for the authorities, but this particular approach, if executed very well, is probably a, a, a good installmental approach to offloading or moving these refineries to people who can better manage them. Right. So now, I'm, I'm glad that you gave us some of that historical insight because in that quest to try and offload these assets, one of the reasons uh, some of the majors would give for being unwilling to engage was that uh, refinery business is about scale and that uh, these refineries, specifically Port Harcourt Refinery as well, simply doesn't have the economies of scale for it to be a feasible business model. Now, with $1.5 billion in debt... What is the likelihood that we're ever going to be able to get out of this debt when we're now calling in for operational and management partners who are going to be taking a good chunk of the proceeds of the refinery business? Well, that's a good question. And indeed, uh, implicit or yeah, kind of implicit within that particular approach is, uh, or the implicit acknowledgement of that approach is that uh, government or the entities that are currently running it are probably putting up their hands and saying, well, look, we're probably uh, not able to run it uh, and to run it sustainably. You know, and, and so that's what uh, effectively uh, I, I think it implies. Now, of course, uh, I would take what has happened more as a courtship. So for any entity that has that sort of capacity, by the way, $2 billion turnover, uh, is not uh, a small amount of money, but assuming you can find that sort of entity either here or abroad, uh, they're more likely to be international entities. Uh, what is done is that it's provided, an, like I said, an installmental approach. So without putting out the capital outlay to acquire the entire entity, you can come in on terms. Of course, the devil is in the details, as we say in my profession. You know, so you can come in on terms, uh, which will be as to the returns, the fees payable, the, ter the term, the tenure, you will definitely have to cover. It will have to cover your your overheads and return a reasonable margin for a guaranteed minimum period. Yeah, and if you come in and you then can see the facility from that sort of inside position, you can then take a long term position. You can decide that okay, I can make this profitable. Then perhaps uh, uh, take out uh, the existing uh, facility acquired the, 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 the refinery maybe as base load to, to an expansion program. Uh, and then uh, from a transactions point of view, that is uh, a potential approach to it. But I have to add that in addition to scale, one of the things that was a disincentive to investing in local refining was uh, basically the, uh, the regulation of the downstream. Now, thankfully, the Petroleum Industry Act has provided a platform and a basis for that to stop. And so the downstream, uh, in effect, now can be deregulated and persons can hopefully sell at cost-reflective prices, return their cost and be able to make a margin. You know? And so, indeed, wherever you start, and, the, and I said that to say this, that uh, in terms of the economies of scale, uh, what it really means is that it does not matter where you start, as long as you can make a return, a fair return for your investment, then wherever you start is, a, is your base load, is your start point and you can scale, as it were, uh, to supply in the local market and export uh, uh, regionally. Okay, so I'd like to ask, with this uh, call for partners, as as, or people that run the refineries, uh, are we set to go? Is there still another investment <coughs> these people will have to make, you know? And how realistic is it to get people that have, or companies that have that might, you know, with over two billion in annual turnover and all of that, then what will also be the process of accountability? Is it going to be just be given to cronies and friends that can just, you know, justify and they can do some quick books, cookbooks for them? Uh, is that going to be the case? And uh, what's going to be 
sort of like the long-term environmental impact assessment because this area, this refinery is working. Now, when it was revamped in the 70s or when it was built by Shell Daisy in 65, 70, thereabout, you don't have this level of development around that area. So what is the impact assessment now like? These are multiple questions I want to ask. Yes, uh, multiple. Uh, I was going to say double barrel, but this is uh, this is almost like machine gun fire. Uh, but great questions, all of them, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the questions that honestly are begging for answers. Um, and, and and I'll respond to as many as I as I can remember. Um, indeed, uh, finding and I alluded to that earlier on. Finding an entity that has a turnover about two billion dollars. You know, the question to ask is, would it be profitable to take over uh, an aged uh, facility and see how you can run it? Or would you just invest the $500 million, build a small thing, test your metal and all of that? I think the, the value proposition here is that um, you basically will observe, uh, I mean, the federal government is observing uh, all the capital outlay associated with refurbishing or sort of effectively reinstalling this particular facility. And so the O&M uh, provider would uh, simply just need to mobilize uh, personnel um, and um, equipment is in, 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 in place, uh, mobilize personnel into place and uh, the overheads that are associated with that. Like I said, what we have is a request for, uh, it's an RO, what's it called? I'm not sure it's even a request for proposal. It's a, I think it's an EOI in, in, um, expression of interest. It's an EOI. So it's very early in the day and early in the process. Now, to one of the questions you've asked, and it's an excellent question, by the way, uh, to say, look, what would be the accountability for this? And it really is up to you and me. And by that, I mean the media, the press, that is the fourth realm of the estate, and the citizens, is that the natural resource economy cannot be and cannot be shrouded in in secrecies you know and that is what the uh, uh what's it called now the um transparency the ex extraction industry transparency international and you might argue that okay refining is not necessarily a, a, a extraction industry but it's associated with tra a, a tra extraction industry and i would make the argument that you know, those principles should apply, the principles of full disclosure. I mean, as you're aware, the principles of the EITI have in fact been embedded within uh, the Petroleum Industry Act to the, effect, to the extent that you can no longer hide, particularly when it involves uh, public uh, companies, when it involves governments. You, you should no longer be able to conceal the details of a transaction on the basis of confidentiality. Even if confidentiality provisions exist, you know, the provisions of the EITI protocol, which is one, domesticated within Nigeria, and two, incorporated by reference, uh, not by reference, honestly, by direct mention in the Petroleum Industry Act, you know, the citizen and the press should be able to, uh, to, 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 to insist and to call for the disclosure of at least key points of any uh, transaction. So the key really is, is this spotlight going to end with a few sound bites when the matter is hot? Or are we going to be able to set up a process of keeping up with this? So it's, like I said, it's just the EOI. Now beyond the EOI, who are, I mean, is there a way of tracking the people that are, uh, that, are uh, that have expressed interest uh, right through the RFP phase, right through the selection phase, right through the negotiation phase, right through the highlights of the agreement? That is how we can avoid even the PNID, because again, I mean, I, I'm one of those persons who feel that even though Nigeria dodged the bullet there, that it is really it would be a tragedy if we repeat those those same errors. And the way to not have to not not repeat those same errors is to do a proper post mortem and ask ourselves what went wrong. And one of the things that went wrong with PNID, in my opinion, is that that particular transaction was uh, shrouded in the typical commercial secrecy, which shouldn't be the case. The thinking essentially is that whoever negotiates this thing on behalf of the people, you know, uh, is in, a tr in the position of a trustee and is accountable to the people. 
you know. And so that's where your, uh, your point comes to. Um, again, whether this is sustainable, quite frankly, I was having a conversation with uh, a friend of mine yesterday, and I said, look, I, uh, firstly, I, I, I think that the, the financiers uh, took a leap of faith to release funds before this particular process was in place. Because indeed, if this was a purely commercial uh, transaction, my, my sense of it is that uh, the O&M should have been in place as a condition precedent to disbursement of the funds. But where we, here we are. Thank God NMPCL uh, has some conscience and they are keeping faith with that particular financing requirement and uh, they're going to put it in place. So again, we'd like to see what the terms are, what the returns are, what the tenure is, you know, and hopefully that will be like a courtship to eventually divesting out of that and reaching that old objective of NMPC becoming a minority shareholder, or as the case may be, a non-shareholder at all. All right. From a business perspective, Mr. Aye, I'd like you to share with us. Would it make, because, I mean, we've, I, I outlined the requirements um, by NNPCL for whoever would become their partner, $2 billion and from 2019 to 2022 balance sheet. From a business perspective, do you think that the potential or the prospect of coming on board to manage um, the refinery in Port Harcourt makes business sense? Would it be attractive for a number of these organizations to want to um, partner with NNPCL? I mean, you've talked about a number of things around governance, um, transparency, and the likes. As it currently stands, do you think that um, you know, organizations will be knocking down the door of NNPCL to submit their bid? Is it commercially viable? Mm. Okay, um, so it's difficult, um, and let me explain, <laughs> it's difficult to say because you see the parameters or the investment criteria for organizations differ. You remember uh, part of the history lesson we began with was that all the IOCs did not have the appetite uh, to, to take over any refinery or indeed build a new one. And some of the things we heard or were told at the time was that, oh, well, as long as the downstream stayed regu regu I mean, regulated and as, uh, then there was no uh, case uh, to invest in, in, a refine in, in a refinery, in a private refinery in Nigeria, and as long as you, know, you regulated uh, the price at the pump. But then along uh, came uh, Dan Gote uh, then, and, you know, and then they came up with the concept of the export uh, processing zone. And so he's uh, producing essentially outside of Nigeria, notionally, and then selling at a cost reflective price. And then you can decide to, uh, to, to, to subsidize it at some point. And then the point is this, is, is then the model, is the business model of the entities that are concerned. Yeah, and, uh, but just off the top of my head, based on everything I know uh, around the industry, I'm wondering, uh, to your question, will there be people beating down the doors? How many people can beat down the doors? That have, but you have to understand first that the appetite for investing in Nigeria is a bit low, unfortunately. We need to do more to be able to increase the appetite uh, to, to attract investment in, in, in this place. And one of those things will be the sanctity of contracts, those kinds of, uh, of, um, of, um, of uh, assurances that people would need to receive. And you're probably just going to have a handful of persons with capacity, serious contenders from around the world. And um, I think the deal they're going to be asking for would be a steal, effectively. Uh, uh, in other words, they're going to be asking for margins that are above the average because of the issues around country risk. So look at the dispute resolution areas as well. You have to ensure that it is a mechanism that is accessible to them and they can uh, easily. I mean, for example, how did we unlock how did Dubai unlock investment? It was by creating a Dubai Arbitration Center, which essentially allowed persons who invested within the Dubai, uh, I mean, in Dubai to go to that arbitration center rather than the Sharia law. So those are some of the things that I, I imagine uh, the decision makers are looking at and putting in place to ensure that, um, and that they get serious contenders for this. But directionally, the approach is not a bad one. Um, it's going to be tough to get people to, take, to, to even come and buy the scraps. Uh, anybody who has that money would rather build a new one. But if you have something you want to offload, I think that 
refurbishing it, putting it out on, on these terms, and uh, seeing how it goes from there is probably not a bad approach. All right, uh, Israel, I a partner at Commercial and Energy Law Practice, Candle. Thank you so much for your time today.